Please give a big round of welcome to the Off the Grid Guru and his alternative building panel here at the Energy Fair. Thank you. All right, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think anyone is more excited for this moment than I am because I discovered the Crush Zone Energy Fair last year. Um, I decided to come up kind of on a whim last minute, and I ended up walking into one of those scenarios where you're at the right place at the right time, you meet all these amazing people. I just happened to have all my equipment with me, and I was able to film some of the demos from last year. So. To give you an idea of what my last year has looked like, ever since I went to the energy fair, I thought, how could I make this uh, combo event even better for me? Because this is my birthday weekend. And I was like, oh man, every year if I could celebrate my birthday and do something awesome uh, that involved natural building and brought all my friends together, what would it be? And this year we decided to go with the builders panel because Donovan, who, bless his heart, has been doing this for years and years and years, he finally decided that he was going to push his talents into some of the other projects, so you can go and check out what Donovan's doing over there. The demo section, just so everyone knows, is over by the pirate ship. So if you go over to the food court area, there's a big pirate ship there, and that's where we're going to be doing all the demos. So before I properly introduce everybody here, I just wanted to give everyone some information uh, briefly, so you get a lay of the land, and we're going to talk a little bit about the schedule. So the Off-Grid Guru booth, where you can get all the information if you miss anything here, or if you want to pick up some of the awesome merchandise that we put together for the first time ever, we've got Off-Grid Guru t-shirts, and there are books and more information available at that uh, booth right there, which I'm looking at here. So main stage, we've got the Off-Grid Guru booth over here, and then we have the demo section, which is over there. I am going to be doing a special... Uh, uh, Earthship model kit class where I'm actually going to be sitting down for those of you who sign up and reserve your seat We're going to be building a small Earthship paper model together And so what you're going to get with that is you're going to get a intro to Earthship systems book Which is Earthships 101 so that explains literally in plain language the basics of the Earthship systems And we're all going to need to have that in the class to sit down and look at the information together it's going to start with a 45-minute Earthships Explained talk, where I'm going to be basically giving the talk that I've uh, crafted over the years that condenses all the information into a short period of time, but without a slideshow, because uh, this is an outdoor event. So we're going to be setting it up in the Wellness Village, and we're going to be on the picnic tables. So everyone's going to want their book, and then we're going to have our paper model. We're going to do a 45-minute talk where we can do some Q&A and everyone can have their questions answered and then we're going to get our hands dirty and we're all actually going to build a little mini Earthship house together. So let me just make sure that I'm covering all the info in my notes here. If you do want to attend the Earthship model kit class, you have to go over to the off-grid bo uh, guru booth to reserve your seat. It is a $30 entry and that includes the book and the paper model. And yeah. I think that's about it for the information, except for I just wanted to mention to everybody that we have um, some handouts. If, you do, if you're really interested in the builder's schedule and you want to know so you don't miss anything, then we actually have some printouts of a, a different schedule. It's not the one online, and it's not the Creston Energy Fair schedule. It is only the builder's demo schedule to make it super easy to understand when everything's happening because there's so much happening at the fair. So you can go and get the builder's demo schedule from there and you'll know exactly what demos we have happening. But I just wanted to give a quick rundown here for anybody who is interested. Right after this, uh, at 1230, we're gonna be ending the natural builders panel. This discussion is gonna end and we are going to take it right over to the builder's demo area and get started right away with a tire pounding demo with Ron Cirillo and Kirsten. They're gonna be doing a Q&A. After that, it's going to be from 2 to 3.30. So from, that's from 12.30 to 1.30. We're going to do a Q&A with Ron and Kirsten and tire pounding demo. That's right over there. Then from 2 to 3.30, not in the demo section, but in the Wellness Village by the picnic tables, we're doing Earthships Explained. And then build your own Earthship model if you want to attend that. Just remember to go get your ticket ahead of time. Uh, we only have so many seats at the picnic tables. They are going to be doing, for those of you who are interested in gasification, a gasification demo over there, 2.30 to 
today as well. So that's overlapping with my talk. So if you don't make it to the talk I'm doing and you want to go check out the gasifier, check out the pirate ship crew. And then after that, from 3.30 to 5, we're going to do Aircrete. Ignacio Cunha from Dome Gaia here is going to be teaching us about Aircrete, and we're going to be pouring some bricks, right? Yeah, so we're actually going to do Aircrete twice this weekend. Those of you who are interested in learning about a material that expands the volume of uh, Portland cement 10 times, giving you 10 times the amount of volume per bag of Portland cement, the equivalent, extremely cheap, mold-resistant, insect-resistant, fireproof, bug-proof, it's an insulative material, it's incredible. Um, we're gonna do two days of Aircrete, so we're really happy to have Dome Gaia here coming all the way from Hawaii, representing the big island, and they have done some amazing uh, exotic builds all over the world, and they're going to give you a little taste of what it looks like over in the demo area at 3.30 to 5, and then tomorrow they're gonna do 2.30 to 3.30, so we're gonna be pouring bricks today. Tomorrow we're gonna pop them open and see how the mixture went, and that's always an exciting process. Today is closing out with a hempcrete demo, 5.30 to 6.30 in this evening with my man Eamon here. And uh, we already have a really awesome uh, video from last year's demo from the energy fair that was super entertaining. So I look forward to seeing what you come out with again. So just before I get started here, I have a little intro that I didn't want to forget, so I wrote it down. I just wanted to say to everybody to welcome to the 33rd annual Crestone Energy Fair Builders Panel, which is being sponsored by the Off Grid Guru Channel. So the Off Grid Guru Channel is featuring inspirational and educational videos about off-grid living of all kinds. I've covered a lot of Earthship projects, but also many other materials, and right now we are increasing all of our material uh, spread plethora going into aircrete, hempcrete, all these different things. And I just wanted to remember, remind everybody that all the guests here today have been featured on the channel, whether it be a dirt to doorknob tiny Earthship documentary with Ron Chirillo, a stellar home tour of an Earthship that she built herself with Kirsten, building low-cost aircrete domes that look incredible with Ignacio and Dome Gaia, or sharing, us, sharing with us how to build with hempcrete. Each of these individuals have shared their special skills with me, and I brought them here to share their skills with you. So I just wanted to quickly introduce how I know everybody here, and then we're going to get into a speed round of questions. Uh, and then we're going to go into a Q&A where we're going to get a little bit deeper into some of the uh, special skills and superpowers that these individuals have that have been saving the world for many years. And uh, that's gonna probably get pretty intense because we're all pretty passionate about that. And then we're gonna open it up for audience questions. So it is 11 now and we have, let's see, let me just put a timer on. So let's make sure we're keeping track of time here. Okay. All right. Let's see, well you're next to me first. So representing Dome Gaia, I am super excited to have you here, Mr. Ignacio Acuna. Thank you. Um, he wants it to be more about Dome Gaia, but I mean, geez, come on, look at this man, beautiful man here. Um, so I met Ignacio because I had been told that I should go study with Dome Gaia and signed up for the uh, workshop that they had in Baja, Mexico. That was in 2019. And you know, one of the reasons why um, Iggy has just become such a intrinsic kind of mentor figure in my life and a friend is because he really believed in me when I first came down there for the 10-day workshop I said look I don't want 10 days you know you need to teach me this this is gonna take time and so I was actually so blessed to be able to stay with Iggy in Baja for two months and um, he was able to in that time teach me you know far above and beyond what I would have learned in just the 10-day workshop and so now you know we are uh, doing other projects together. We just came back from Utah this year actually for another amazing 10-day workshop and I documented the entire thing. So we're gonna have that up on the YouTubes as well for everybody to check out. Um, so yeah, you can already see Iggy on the channel right now. We've done a short video covering the Utah builds and I have some other videos that mention Aircrete. Um, but just briefly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run down the stories here. So Ron Chirillo, man, Ron, Ron, Ron Chirillo. Th this man is a legend. I don't know if anybody realizes this here. Um, but anyways, Ron, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about you, dude. <laughs> These two right here are basically family. These two right here are basically family. Just, just like Iggy gave me a chance uh, to study Aircrete and, and, and live there for a little while and do that. I mean, geez, you two have just done so much for me and for this movement. And I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, if it weren't for some of you 
who really believed in me early on when I went to the Earthship Academy as a little 18-year-old baby in diapers. Basically, now we're talking 10 years later, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to do all this awesome stuff. And they're like, yeah, right. All the students say that. They get super inspired and then they don't do anything. And I remember when I came back and handed you the Earthship model kit and I said, look, I told you I was going to make a buildable <laughs> Earthship thing. And he did. So anyways, uh, Ron gave me an opportunity to come back and be a part of his tiny Earthship build and then film it and do it dirt to doorknob. So that was an incredible opportunity because I had been waiting for years to get onto an Earthship crew professionally from dirt to doorknob, everything from start to finish and learn every single facet of building these things. And you were able to give me the opportunity to do that from your wealth of knowledge, which comes from 15 years of building Earthships with Earthship Biotexture climbing your way up through the ranks to the point where now, I mean, you're basically a free man. You are, there's not that many Earthship builders out there, you know, and you're one of them. And it's, 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 it's a real blood, sweat, and tears craft. And so I'm really grateful for people like you who have taken something that takes so much determination and hard work and to continue to do it, you know, even when your body doesn't want to do it anymore, you know, and then to pass the torch on to us, you know, and make these opportunities available. It's been amazing. So for those of you who... Uh, don't know, Kirsten and Ron um, were intrinsic in founding the Earthship Academy where I basically got a start in this uh, industry. So uh, my relationship with Kirsten is special because she knew me, uh, you know, when I was 18 and <laughs> came out, you know, early on quite young to the Academy and I had a lot of ideas and I was always coming and spitballing in the office with her. But we actually came up together with some pretty great ways to share this educational content and I think our passion for educating people has just grown over the years. And on the YouTube channel, I have some tours of Kirsten's house that she has uh, built on the Mesa there in the greater world in Taos. And it's one of my favorite Earthships, and I'm not just saying that. It really is. It's such a beautiful home, and I've stayed in it so many nights and had so many great experiences. But also, we did a great interview explaining uh, what you're working on now, and that's even more interesting to me than what you've done before. Um, because you and I have some big things going ahead in our future here, uh, working on educating people about not just Earthships, but every single other possible facet of what it looks like to take your life from point A to point B in terms of finding that self-sufficiency that you need to live the lifestyle of your dreams, really. you know. And then these two men here, oh my God. I, was, I called you and, oh geez, this is so funny. So... I was like, oh, what was that hempcrete builder's name? I was like, oh, that's right, it was Eamon, Eamon. So I'm looking in my phone, I find Eamon. I'm like, oh, he probably won't even remember me. So I call him up, and literally the first thing on the other line I hear, oh, yeah, hey, Eric, how's it going? Sorry, man, I'm building a 400-foot wall right now. I can't talk. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> so I don't even know what to say about you. You're, a, you're just a monster. You're like some kind of Hercules man, you know? He comes in to do the hempcrete demo, and he's got, you know... Everything, like the, the whole Hempcrete demo on, on the YouTube channel right now, if you watch it, you'll get his energy. You got such a special energy. And the way that you handled working with the kids and involving everybody in that demo was amazing. And here's the thing people don't realize. I've heard your voice, your voice, your voice, your, well, not your voice, but your voice in editing for hours and hours on repeat. So I've spent so much time with you. <laughs> More than you've spent with me. For every, for every one minute we spend together, I have to spend 10 times that in the editing room. Right. So it really feels like I got to spend a lot of time with cool. you, even though we haven't properly you know, spent time together, right? Yeah. And I really like the way that you went about doing that because you know, everyone has their special skills, their talents that they can share. Not everyone can translate that into something that's really fun and interactive for everybody and inclusive. And it was really fun to watch you uh, tell the kid as he was smashing his fist into the hempcrete mix that looked like oatmeal, oh, this looks like oatmeal. And then you were like, no, no, don't eat that. We'll go get a cookie after if you want something. We'll get a cookie after. Oh, OK, 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 amen. All right, so anyways, I just had to get personal for a second to give everybody a little bit of a, a look into uh, you know, how, how I know these individuals and I am going to switch over now to the first couple sets of questions here, um, which is going to be the speed round. So I've told everybody that they have 30 seconds on the clock, uh, but I have to read from my phone at the same time. So I don't know. Do you want? Does somebody want to take their phone out and do a? Can we? Can we get a harsh timekeeper here? Can we get like, bam, 30 seconds speed round? All right. Okay, so 
I wanted to come up with some fun, compelling, short questions that'll reveal a little information about these individuals without getting super deep just yet. And I'm just gonna give an example, okay? So for this speed round of questions, I came up with uh, something, I'll, I'll just give you my answer here. So you guys listening? Everyone knows you for blank. In my case, it would be everyone knows me from the Off Grid Guru channel, but my secret superpower is, so in my case, in my case, it's storytelling. So, you know, everyone knows me for doing aircrete domes. Okay. In that case, domes. right? Um, and my superpower is designing, drafting, um, yeah, uh, imagining alternative lives, and, uh, lifestyles, and also alternative structures. I guess that would be mine. Okay, um, so I would say I'm pretty well known in the Earthship world. I started in 2006 as an intern volunteer. It was supposed to be a 30-day program. So 17 years later, here I am. I'm still doing it. So <clears throat> the, uh, the thing I'm probably best well known for is uh, just being having a contagious personality and trying to inspire people to believe in the ability of, you know, getting off the grid and building a you know 100% autonomous, self-sufficient home while you're using recycled and natural materials to help the planet at the same time. You know that's the biggest thing for me is I'm not interested Five in seconds. just my own personal achievements. <laughs> it's what I leave behind. I love you. Goodbye. What is your superpower? That is my superpower. The contagion. The contagion. No, his superpower is organizing. He is a Virgo. Mm. He's super organized, and I have never been on a more organized job site. That's it. I gotta say it. Yeah. I say it's inspiring people. Ron's okay. superpower is inspiring people and All making right. them feel amazing. Everyone knows me from Earthships, but my secret superpower is transcending that and connecting with people around the world to help people decide what's right for them. You know, Earthships are an amazing product, but they come with a capital E and a lot of other things involved. Whereas people need to decide what's right for them, for their budget, for their lifestyle, and their situation. Thank you. Sure, go for it. I can't go. Hi, I'm Roland. Um, I'm starting to become more known um, as the Hemp Creek guy, along with Eamon um, and our company. Um, my my talent or my superpower is crunching the numbers and planning and doing all the computer stuff. Yes. Oh. Cancel and start again. Yeah. Hello, my name's Eamon McNaughton. Um, everybody around here knows me for the Hempcrete, and I've been doing that for about two and a half years. Uh, love building. I guess my superpower is uh, probably working with children, and um, uh, I've also been a tennis pro for about 30 years. And uh, yeah, connecting, connecting people. I like seeing people together, trying to uh, make everybody, um, you know, work together and be one. Great. Keep it, keep it. So, because this question is going to be easy for you, unless you choose a sneaky different answer, okay. which is, could also be, I mean. Is this still a speed round? This is still a speed round. Oh, boy. Let's go. Oh, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> okay, I got a good question for you. Uh-oh. If you had to pick only one material to save the world, what would it be and why? Well, that's kind of easy for me, hemp. Uh, why? Because it's got 40,000 uses. You can, make, uh, you can drive cars on it, you can make plastics with it, you can <laughs> um, make everything with it. I mean, you can build with it, obviously, you can feed people, you can get people healthy. Um, yeah, hemp, hemp has the opportunity to really save the world. Yeah. yeah, I can't really add to that. <laughs> um, hemp is a remarkable uh, plant, um, has so many applications. Um, yeah, there's really nothing that comes close, I don't think. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would say earth. It's so versatile. You can ram it into tires, you can pour it into bricks, you can dig a hole in the dirt and put a roof on it, you can sculpt with it, you can do floors, you can do walls. It's natural, it feels good on your skin, it's beautiful, it's healthy, it's, it's just an amazing material. I love it. 
Earth. I'm glad you said that. Somebody represent Mother Earth. Come on. Mother Earth. Let's go. Yeah, for me, it's all about tires. Um, <laughs> hundreds of millions of tires are thrown in landfills in the ocean and on playgrounds and ridiculous use of that byproduct with pounding them. Uh, it's a forever building material. It's not going to go anywhere. And then I want to evolve out of ramming tires to doing tire bell construction, which is reasonably common here in Colorado, but I want to bring it to northern New Mexico and, uh, and start building affordable housing for military veterans. Nice. The timer was for Ron, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> um, I would have to say... I'd have to agree with hemp, and I'd have to agree with earth. Um, those, are to, to me, are the two most amazing materials that we have at our access right here, affordable and um, low-carbon footprint to getting them to your location. I can't think of anything better than that, honestly. Um, and also sand, but that's also um, that you have to bring in, and we're depleting our sand. So, um, But definitely earth, definitely hemp. Um, Wow. All right, all right. Okay, I'm not going to ask you why you didn't say why you didn't say air creep, but that's because <laughs> I have another question which is going to lead us into that. All right. So, we are the kind of freaks who are like sitting over breakfast or lunch or dinner or or working while talking about other materials and other techniques literally 24/7 we are talking about these kinds of crazy things. So, and I've been very curious to ask this question of all of you. What is a cutting edge or unexplored material or technique that you are excited to get into so you cannot choose your own uh, specialty? What is a new thing that's either cutting edge or coming up on the horizon or that you just haven't explored yet? Maybe it's an old technique, super simple, but you just haven't used it yet. What are you looking to get your hands into? 30 seconds on the clock, Ignacio, let's go. Um, I've been really interested in geotextiles and impregnating geotextiles with cement and making thin shell um, concrete um, roofs and um, shell, uh, shell structures. Um, I've been making bathtubs recently with uh, thin shell concrete. And uh, that, th that is, uh, you use like a, a fraction of the cement and you are able to get some really high strength, especially if you're using um, a lot of curvaceous uh, 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 geometry, so. So in northern New Mexico, our biggest concern, uh, except for this year, has been water. Uh, we typically get eight inches of annual precip. So Mr. Reynolds, the, my former employer, uh, recycles water four ways. I recycle water a fifth way, but I need to get in compliance with the EPA and, um, you know, just to be able to get approval for being able to treat black water. Uh, with water being such a scarcity all over the planet and people complaining about it all the time, you know, by recycling in an additional way and being able to bring it back in, I think that can have a huge impact on housing. I want to experiment with 3D printing with Adobe Mud. And there's people that are doing that, but I want to learn everything about it. A lot of 3D printed houses are printed with concrete, but there's ways to print with mud. You have to get more specific about your mix because there's a little more shrinkage with mud mixes than with concrete. But you can scale it really quickly. You have one unit that can build 10 houses at a time, make them passive solar, make them off the grid. And I think it would just be an amazing combination of low tech and high tech. Boom. <laughs> Bam, before the bell. Let's go. Yeah, so very similarly uh, for Hempcrete, uh, also the 3D printing option. Um, the challenge there is getting the consistency or getting the head um, to deal with the consistency of hempcrete, which doesn't have the viscosity that um, traditional 3D printing would have. That was very short and sweet. Okay, I'm really excited about um, combining these practices together, um, not just using hempcrete for a whole house, but understanding elevations of a house and what is necessary, and also understanding that hempcrete may not be good for certain environments and others will be. So uh, recognizing your uh, local area and using the proper materials for that area. Okay. Okay, this one's going to be weird. I don't know if they're all going to have an answer for this because this is kind of a hard question. But I, 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 if you can it just, just say something stupid. Just make Try something us. up. Let's go. Okay, so if you could create a tool to make your life easier, right, 
And it doesn't just have to be a straightforward tool. Like, if you could create a technology that made your life easier, what would it be? It could be related to building specifically, but could be also something else. Let me, let me start the timer. Yeah. Well, also, you make your own tools. So that's why I, this question's a little unfair, because he literally makes his own tools depending on what application. I'll go on that real quick. So we actually do make our own tools on the spot all the time, because some don't fit uh, uh, certain nooks and crannies. But I actually did create a certain way of uh, applying hempcrete that could uh, speed up the process uh, extremely fast. So one person would do a four by eight section, and it would take them about six to eight hours. And with this machine, it would take about 20 minutes. Um, yeah, similarly, with, with hempcrete, there are already existing um, spray applicators. Um, most of them were invented in France, um, and there are some modifications for the American market, but they, are, they don't yet quite work the way we need them to work. So that's, that's the big, big one. I would create a electromagnetic interference gun that I could focus on people's homes and disrupt their existing grid lifestyle so they would have to think about how to use their resources in a more thoughtful way. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. How am I supposed to follow that one? Did you know you were married to a supervillain? <laughs> yeah, now I do. I don't know, guys. For me, I mean, um, human energy is the only clean energy. And whenever you're talking about tools, you're talking about embodied energies, pollution, you know, some form of byproduct. That's why I like just a sledgehammer and a tire and a, some, a dirt. And I'm, I'm building. I'm going at it. I mean, yeah, I agree with, you know, certain pieces of equipment and machinery. I'm a heavy equipment operator. So, I mean, there's quicker ways to put together tire bales and using shotcrete machines and all that to cut down on labor costs. I'm a big fan of that as well. But human energy is the best tool on the planet. Good. Um, we, uh, Dome Guy, we developed a machine called the Little Dragon, and that helps you um, make foam in order to inject it into cement and increase the volume of cement by 10 times. Um, so that's a pretty uh, amazing little uh, tool that we made and we're now we're coming out with a new machine called the magic dragon and that one will mix your cement and inject the foam so you don't even have to mix it um, and that'll be all inclusive and it'll pump it to wherever you want we might be able to even create enough pressure to spray it um, and an another tool that I really would like to invent is a lightsaber <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right you heard it folks the magic dragon Okay, this one's just for fun for me because I don't know everybody here and I'm kind of curious what your answer is going to be. <clears throat> if you don't have a, a, a top one because you have traveled so much, then pick top three. Exotic locations that have been the best experiences, uh, your best exotic build location experiences. Like I've gone to Mexico, I told you guys ever before, Utah recently was really cool and I've been to Europe. So that's my three. Um at Dome Gaia, we have workshops all over the world, um, but we primarily do North America and Central America. My ones that I've really loved is Tulum in Mexico. That was a beautiful workshop. We're actually one, we're having a workshop coming up in Tulum. That'll be fantastic. It's a beautiful spot. Um, Portugal was probably my favorite. Like that was just gorgeous. Um, and then what? Uh, what is the other one? It doesn't Utah. Yeah, oh, Utah. Okay. Utah was amazing. I was going to say you ran out of time. So early on in my career, after my internship program, I was sent to England and then France and back to France and then Jamaica and all over. And I was like, all right, this is pretty cool. But we ended up building a music school, language school in on Easter Island. And the, the people that uh, were running the program uh, came to me one day when we had all these necks for the bottles to make the bottle bricks. And I was like, hey, can we send these back to the recycling center? He said, no, this is the final uh, location destination for all materials on site. So we had to get really creative and figure out ways of like putting them in the mixer and grinding them down and bringing all the subfloors up and mixing it into concrete. That was really inspirational to me to not create a byproduct from a byproduct. 
And that lesson was taught to me on that island and realizing how precious it is to protect that land. And I learned that of all countries I've worked in, I learned that there. That was amazing. I would say Uruguay, where we built the first public school um, that was an earthship. And it was a beautiful experience. We had students from 60 different countries come and learn and build this public primary school, which was oversubscribed. Every parent wanted to send their kids to this amazing school. And now the group we worked with there is scaling that and building public schools in every country in Latin America, which is amazing. And we're hoping to integrate the education designed by Matt Panitz at Long Way Home in Guatemala, who's created an entire curriculum for K through 12th grade, where every course, every week, every subject is about off-grid sustainable living, teaching kids these skills for the future. Uh, so being a relatively new business, Rocky Mountain Hemp Build hasn't built that many homes yet, but um, my clear number one has to be Crestone, where we are Woo! building two homes this summer. Uh, yeah, uh, in terms of exotic, I would have to say this place right here is one of the most exotic places I've ever been with the highest frequency on the planet and all the beautiful people here. Um, another place that we um, did a little demo was down in Moab. That was pretty cool. Uh, but where I've helped build, uh, not Hempcrete, but um, uh, Sligo. Sligo, Ireland is uh, where my family's from. Awesome. I was really curious about with you two, and I'm glad that you brought up Crestone because this is a very interesting place. And as we get into the meat of this conversation, you know, just to warm us up, obviously these questions were fun. But we're here to talk about some serious, uh, real, tangible things here. So we're going to bring it a little bit back down to earth, and I have some questions prepared for everybody. To greater or lesser extent, everyone on this panel knows about Crestone. You know, I've been bringing Ron and Kirsten here. We've been looking at land. I personally own land in the community. We've been looking at developing here for some years. Did you get your land? You got land yeah. in the community as well. So we have some community landowners here, um, the two of us. I'm not sure yet, Eamon, do you, did, you, did your parcel come through? We backed out on that, but we're going to get another one. Thanks, Nick. All right. Yeah. So, um, so on the panel here, we have two current landowners. Definitely. Very, very soon, soon to be residents. Three. Three, three landowners and, and a soon to be. All right. So that means that our gears have been turning thinking about what we're going to build. And to me, that's the most interesting because now as we take this conversation in a more collaborative direction and ask the question, first of all, because not everyone on this panel might even define a home in the same way. And I think I'm actually gonna start, you wanna start with how do we define a home? No. No? <laughs> Amen, let's go. How do you define a home? What is your idea of, of a dwelling? Is this uh, speed round still? This is not speed round. Oh, okay, cool. So we're just gonna quickly go through and talk about what all of our definitions of a home are and then we're going to go into how we would design a home for this climate, for okay. this particular area, for this region, the materials, the layout, whatever your heart fancies. To find a home, a home is a sanctuary. We spend so much time in it. Um, uh, in order to uh, create a true home, I think you have to also recognize, like I said earlier, where you are, um, how to build in this region. Um, understand that we have tons of sun here, so use it, um, especially with elevations and where to put windows, where to put the insulation, where to put the thermal mass. Like I said earlier, uh, combining these materials. Um, I have a dream of building a home, not just of a hempcrete home, but um, when you need thermal mass uh, on the south side, you might use um, the uh, aircrete. Um, east and west walls could be um, hempcrete, and then the north side could be either earthship or um, uh, I think straw bale as well, because you need a lot of insulation. But just understanding where you are and uh, using, using the sun and using the elevations to create um, a nice space that is warm and comfortable where you don't have to use a lot of HVAC. Yeah, um, traditional building is a lot about keeping elements out, and uh, so water out, uh, uh, sun out, um, and therefore trying to create a uh, 
you know, a barrier that's impermeable. And, and actually, Hemp Creek goes counter to that principle. It's actually um, a, a semi-permeable membrane as, as such. It allows moisture to go through, um, which, of course, then also regulates temperature. And um, so that's how I like to think of um, a, a structure that it's, that it's not actually as rigid as traditional and that, that we allow that kind of um, permeability. Nice. I think a home should heat and cool itself completely naturally with no backup systems. I think every home should harvest all of its own water and be designed with water efficiency in mind so that you can use that water by recycling gray water, recycling black water. A home should be independent with its power systems and not just in the sense of like, okay, I'm going to take this, my conventional home and slap you know sixty thousand dollars worth of solar panels on it you need to design efficiency into your building from the get-go so that you can use the fewest number of solar panels because there's embodied energy with that itself um, a home should be something that you could build yourself if possible i think that's a really beautiful thing to live in a home that you've built yourself and it should be healthy to live in and have beautiful, warm spaces and lots of natural light. And of course, I totally agree with all that, obviously, because we live in the same home. <laughs> <clears throat> but for me, when I started my career with Earthships, it was the way it made me feel when I walked in. I'm an Italian boy. My family comes from Calabria. Uh, we never shook hands. We don't even know. I never knew what a handshake was. We greeted each other with a hug. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, that kind of dropped off quite a bit, unfortunately. But my home does that for me. When I walk in the door, it, you know, the laws of physics and thermodynamics are happening automatically with no HVAC systems. I love that. I don't like hearing pumps and, and things moving. And I like a peaceful, embracing home when I walk in there. That natural light coming from the skylights and through the passive solar windows. Uh, the thermal mass, just keeping that temperature exactly where all humans uh, need it to be. I'm pretty low to the floor, so I like, I like <laughs> that temperature really comfortable down there. You know, and, and the other thing about me is, you know, as a contractor for all these years and coming home, you know, you go to work, you bust your butt all day long, and then you come home and you're like, oh, I got to fix this, I got to fix that. I like to build houses that are going to last for centuries. I don't want maintenance, and especially with cost of materials, and labor, those things, you know, that mentality needs to end. We need to build housing that is going to last, you know, past my granddaughter's lifestyle. In fact, when I build, I think about my granddaughters living in a home that I'm putting together, not just for me. I don't build houses for selfish, for selfish reasons. I do it for the future generations, just like the Native Americans do in Taos. They think seven generations, and I do the same thing. So that's what... To me, housing should be all about. Nice. Well, my house for me is, um, I like to think of my body as a house. And I'd like for my house to be thought of as a body. Um, it has lungs. It has a skin. It has a heart. Um, and I believe that it should, I should use that as my model. My body is, is the model of my house. Um, I agree with everything everyone said here. Um, I, I believe that a house should be made also with the least amount of energy uh, uh, carbon footprint um, as possible. So making materials like extend, extend, the, the, extend the, the, um, the material as much as possible. Um, I believe in uh, like this thin shell concrete thing really interests me because you're using minimal amounts of material to make large spans. Um, but I, uh, it, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. I could go on and on and on. I just, it's, that's a big question for me, you know? Of course. Yeah. It's, it's a, a big question. It's, it's, we're, we're going to dissect it even further now. Yeah, yeah. So we have some different definitions of what we consider to be a home here, all of which I think are fantastic. Um, the sanctuary idea, absolutely. Uh, my idea of off-grid is like off outside of this box rather than off-grid. I take it uh, more like outside the box. So I really like the fact that you said the house is like a permeable 
membrane. It's more like something that breathes because for me, that's the quality that I would really like to, uh, you know, the way I'd like to influence the world is that I open up the boxes more, you know, and that's one way, right, to bring the outside in. And then, of course, Kirsten, you and I have talked about this so much. It's just a constant philosophical debate. <laughs> but um, I guess uh, the home, the body being the home, right? So, you know, everyone has a different idea of what that home represents. And for me, I, uh, you know, I don't know what the hell even actually they're talking about here, all this off-grid, uh, fancy-schmancy stuff. You know, why should I care about that? Because to me, all I need is a pre-manufactured box, right? I'll get a lot over here in the chalets and I'll throw a pre-manufactured box on there with a, you know, heating and cooling system on it. Um, some linoleum floors, you know, some, some laminate, uh, fake, fake wood flooring. And, uh, that's actually, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. So, you know, I, I was thinking guys, if you could convince me otherwise, why wouldn't I just get a on-demand delivery home that I could just slap down on my property, connect the water, connect the gas, why not have the hookups and why not have the bills? T tell me why, please, Eamon. Let's start with you. Because I'm going for it. You've got to convince me right now on the stage. I'm, I'm going to buy a pre-manufactured house and throw it, slap it down. Why would I use any other material? Do you like being sick or do you like being healthy? I love being sick. Keep going. You love being sick? <laughs> okay. Well, then chew on your walls. Okay. That drywall is delicious. Those VOCs are wonderful. Suck them in. Right? So... Um, a healthy home is not just for the planet, it's for the uh, people in it. Um, you will see your health um, last longer. Uh, you're not, you spend, what, 90% of time indoors, and if you think about like the carpet in your bedroom, right, the walls, the insulations, the VOCs, the paints, you sleep in that all night long, right? Sucking that in. So. Um, I'm a big fan of um, waking up in a house that feels good, that um, keeps me comfortable, keeps me warm, and uh, yeah, I'd say that's it. Um, so how do you like paying bi bills? Bills? Oh man, um, it's, it's Your electricity great. bill, heating bill, um, if you build it cleverly, um, you can reduce it by a lot. Um, specifically building with hempcrete, you can, uh, in most cases, get rid of your HVAC system because of what I described earlier about moisture being allowed to escape through the walls. Um, and so, yeah, it'll, uh, the, in the long run, it'll be cheaper. Um, you might pay a little more up front um, for the quality up front, but in the long run, it'll be cheaper. You said it yourself, Eric, you're going to buy a box. You're going to live in a box. A box inherently doesn't have anything but maybe some protection from the elements, which in this climate, I don't even know how long that's going to last, you know, with wind, sun, snow, whatever else is going on. You're going to have when these, this network of systems that we're completely dependent on has any failure, your box is not going to function. You could die in your box. You could freeze oh, no. to death in your box. You could die have heat in stroke box. in your box. Oh, my you God. You could have no internet in your box. What are you going to do? I'm How are you going to have your channel with no internet? This is too you, much. You are, you are a young <laughs> man, and you need to come into the modern world. What if I told you I was going to take away your cell phone and give you a landline to conduct all your business and all your life with might a landline well phone? You might as well just be home right now. Now, waiting for sending a fax, yep. waiting for a phone call. That's what a conventional house is. It is the landline of homes. You need the cell phone of homes. You need to be autonomous, resilient, and independent and modern. Eric, please. All right. Can I get my tea? Wow. Okay. I hate following Kirsten. <laughs> Use this opportunity to grill me even harder than All she right. did. Let's roast. Okay. Let's. Uh, so you're a young entrepreneur. You're a you're a business owner. You've got merchandise. You've got a channel. You're all about subscribers. That's that generation. I don't know much about it, but I hear it's a thing, and maybe it can pay for some things, and all that's great. But for me, as a businessman, I'm thinking about, you know, not only investment in my health, which I agree with 100%. I just celebrated my 56th birthday Wednesday. Ooh. Eric's birthday's Monday. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, I mean, I'm feeling healthy, strong, 
happy, energized every morning. I mean, that's an investment in my, in my work, in my, you know, and just in my existence as a human and, and being able to commit to, you know, helping people. And when you live in a box like he's talking about throwing down on the ground, that's completely detached from the environment. It's detached from even his dog is not going to like living in that thing. You know, I mean, you, you got to think about, you know, the investment in real estate and what's been happening. Look at Crestone, look at Taos. I mean, we, if we sold our house, we wouldn't be able to buy it back tomorrow. If you throw down some piece of crap with a bunch of utility bills that continue to go up and with an unpredictable, there, there was a time when I was, when I bought my first house, the gas bill would show up. I lived in Cleveland. The gas bill would show up and I would look through that little window and squeeze the bill. And if I saw more than two digits, <laughs> I tossed that thing out so fast. I was like, man, let them shut it off. I can't afford a three-digit utility bill in 1985. So in you know, 2030, 2035, where's he going to be? Instead of like we said up here already, make the investment in your home now. It's already too late for most of us. You know, the cost of building materials and all this is out of control. So if you're going to make this investment, you better be wise about your choices. Yeah, I agree um, with everything everyone said. Um, Eric, you're an artist. Why would you want to live in a box? I mean, they're uh, they're ugly. I mean, most. I mean, the quality of life inside these houses that we're talking about is 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 through the roof. It's they're beautiful. An earthen floor compared to a vinyl floor. There's no comparison. You know, an earthen an earthen wall compared to a uh, a drywall and acrylic paint. There's no comparison. The the way that sound even travels inside an Adobe house. If you ever you could sit right next to somebody while someone's making uh, dinner and you can have a, a, an intimate conversation. Sound doesn't vibrate through the through the house like that. Um, it's efficient. It's warm. It's cozy. It's like being in a blanket. You know. Um, and it's cost effective, as everyone is saying. The price of materials right now, we're being gouged. You know, uh, people are taking full advantage of us, and I, I'm not going to stand for it. Are you going to stand for it, Eric? Because that's basically what you're wanting. Ah, ah, yes. <laughs> Roast away. <laughs> okay. So now that I've played devil's advocate, <laughs> let's talk about some of the options that are available here in Crestone. If we pass the mic back to my man over here with the hemp shirt. So you're thinking about moving to Crestone or some other community, what have you. I mean, let's just broaden the scope a little bit because there are many regions that have a very similar climate than this. I mean, we're talking about the southwest of the U.S., okay? So this doesn't just apply to Crestone alone. Obviously, not everyone's going to be living here. So don't take it for complete face value here, you know, if you're looking at developing a house that is going to be similar to that of which would encounter the elements and have this type of climate. So let's just say we have this mountainous region here. We have four seasons. We've got a harsh winter, right? But we do have sun most of the time during the days. So that's one of the advantages. So I don't need to blabble on about this because I brought the experts to talk to you about it. But we've all been thinking and you can, you can get a little crazier if you want. We've all been thinking, what, what would first of all, what materials would we choose to build with and what design in this region? Maybe even houses you've already seen that you were inspired by. I have a whole list of them on my hand. So I can tell you about houses I've seen in Crestone that worked, that worked well for some reasons or not as well for other reasons. And really, you're the man to talk to you about this because this guy is like, you're committed. You're building. How, what kind of house are you building right now? Let's just talk right now about the house that you're already building. Uh, right now, we're building a mother-in-law suite with a garage. Um, it's about 800 square feet, and uh, yeah, it's it's going to be beautiful and comfortable. And so, uh, the couple that are uh, hired us to do this are, will be living in that until they build uh, the rest of the home. But right now, we're uh, doing that part, and uh, we're very excited about it. So, in terms of building here, yeah, in terms of specifically, here. Um, uh, I'd say the greatest. Um, water is very important. So I think earth ships have absolutely nailed how to use water properly. Um, use water over and over. 
um, and capture it because it doesn't rain here a lot. Um, <laughs> you would never know that from the past few days, which has made our, our lives a lot of fun building in the last few days with all this rain, uh, but it doesn't come often. And the, uh, I'd say the greatest resource we have is this sun. So passive solar design is the single most important thing, I would say, when building your house. Put the windows in the right places uh, and put the insulation and the thermal mass in the right positions with uh, the proper overhangs. Short and sweet, love it. Um, yeah, obviously I'm gonna recommend hempcrete um, for reasons that I've already discussed some of, um, but the other main one, especially in this region here, is that the hemp that we build our houses with are grown yes. within 30 miles of here. Um, so they're attractive. actually from the valley, um, and yes. that is incredible um, because transportation for a lot of other building materials adds to their embodied... Yeah. Well, some coming from China, um, Canada. Um, so the more local we can be, the better. I think you have a lot of options here, like you mentioned, which is amazing. We have a similar situation in Taos. We have a climate that supports different building envelopes that are alternative and sustainable, all different kinds. So you have a lot of choices. You know, Ron and I have talked about what would we do up here, and we talked about doing something that was part earthship and part some insulative building material so that we weren't pounding as many tires, maybe pound the first few courses with with tires and then do hempcrete or some other pumicecrete, something else on top. I think for you, Eric, building here, one of the things you have to consider is time factor. You want to build a house that you and your dad could be in. You don't want to take the next you know, 20 years of your life to build a super labor intensive house. So one thing you might consider for here would be pumicecrete because you could form it and pour the walls within a day. They can be structural. You can put the beams right on. Like you could really move into enclosure really quickly, which I think would be a huge advantage for you. I mean, it's not, I mean, there's embodied energy in getting those materials here. It does use some cement, but the forms are reusable. You can form the window and door spaces right in it. You can lay the electrical conduit and the plumbing right in the walls. It's the dream material to plaster on top of, as I mentioned, hempcrete is as well, because it's so flat yet has a texture. So as opposed to earthships, where it's all these layers and layers and layers of plastering forever. I mean, I'm sure there's clips probably in the of Ron's left, last house of me just like in the corner, not talking to anybody, just plastering and plastering <laughs> and plastering. And so um, I think with something like pumicecrete, you could get that. And they work now with varying the thermal mass. And so it's not just insulative. You can make an inner wide of the pumicecrete that's more dense, that would store more temperature and have the outside be more insulative. I just think because time is a factor for you, that would speed it up and you could start doing the finishes and the systems more quickly. Great. So almost as fast as putting a box down, I could put pumice creek walls up and have my rafters up in a weekend. Yes. Oh, and both the pumice creek, which is lava stone, for those who don't know, it's a mixture of lava stone and um, a binder like a cement uh, type of glue that basically you have a truck that pumps all the lava rock, small pebbles of lava rock that's been mixed uh, into forms. And so the whole thing can cure uh, basically in one day and be poured in one day. And it's locally sourced. There's a, in Alamosa, they have the Red Rock Lava Company where you can go and buy for landscaping and agricultural purposes and for the freaks like us who choose to build with it, that purpose. Um, and then also, I don't know if you meant it. Sorry, Ron, but all the hemp they're talking about is grown in the San Luis Valley, guys. This is the biggest win for the natural building community in like... I mean, it's a win for the planet, but first of all, the when I heard that, when I heard that you could actually get the raw material that you need to build an entire structure, basically, with local lumber, so with local lumber and then with the hempcrete, you can basically source everything from within 30-mile radius of here, which to me and to everyone here who has one eye open should be extremely attractive. Uh, sorry, but to continue, Ron. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand what the question is. What do I, what would I recommend based on the Crestone climate, what the build? Well, I know that you're excited about throwing some tire bail houses down. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I am. The, pro- the thing that comes to mind with Crestone is it's you know obviously very remote, and we've seen what's been going on with building materials, transportation costs, and on and on. And I don't know when that might stabilize, if it will. Uh, I think the thing with a location like Crestone, and again, like that island mentality that I've developed when I'm building sustainable housing, um, it's, it requires talking to locals. It requires, you know, talking to the people that have been here for several decades, not, you know, the people that come in and get awestruck by the mountain and the sun and all that coming from Cleveland, like me and a couple of my buddies that are here. And, you know, you got to talk to, you know, the local, you know, sources, like they're saying, you know, I mean, you have to take advantage of that. And then when you can collaborate with other builders that have already been here a while, one of the biggest things here is to work as a community and not as an individual. So the problem that most of us have is in our mentality is we're going to come in and we're going to beat on that ground and we're going to push our will and we're going to make it be what we want it to be. Working for, you know, the guru in New Mexico has taught me one thing is you have to comply. You have to be willing to negotiate. And when it comes to building materials or building designs or envelopes and talking to architects and engineers and local officials, you know, you have to come in with that open-minded, you know, sort of outlook on what it is. Because, you know, like he's saying, he might want to drop a box down. It might not work. You know, the water table might be too low. Uh, the annual precip numbers are too low based on the square footage of your roof. Can I get cisterns below ground if I've got basalt, volcanic soil? You know, what am I contending with? Where, which direction is the water running off the topography of the ground? You know, that's what we call a site evaluation. We do a test hole. You know, and then right there and then, that might tell me whether or not I can do it or I can't do it. You know how many people I've consulted in my career and they got all these grand ideas of what they want, you know, their dream earthship, their dream building, and I ain't crushing people's dreams. You know, I'm, I crush them every day. I love it, man. I love wiping that stupid smile off your face and saying, hey, man, look, let's get to the real world here and find out what works in Crestone. What works in Taos? What works on Easter Island? You know, we've sent Vigas from Ogeens and Taos to, to Canada. We took sand to the beach, people. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got you to gotta be willing to understand what Mother Nature is providing. Keep in mind, everybody understands what climate change is right now. If you're just saying it's a hoax or it's just, you know, some made-up thing that politicians say... You know, I got news for you, man. Like, he was talking about rain the last few days. It's been biblical storms. Like, I mean, I'm seeing, like, roof leaks that has provided job security for for me for the rest of my life. (laughs) I don't have to pound tires anymore. All I got to do is fix roofs. It's amazing. And I make ten times the money. It's awesome. So it's like, you know, I love, I love, this is my third visit to Crestone. I understand the attraction, you know, Taos. It's called the land of enchantment. We call it the land of entrapment because there is an incredible natural beauty. But again, if you come out here with, you know, some, I'm not going to mention any states in the United States with that mentality and you're throwing a bunch of money around, you're going to go through a lot of money. You know how you become a millionaire in Taos? You bring two. You get it? We grab you by your ankles. We turn you upside down. We shake every dime out of your pocket. Crestone is very good at that as well. If you don't come out here and you don't talk to the locals and you don't find out where you source indigenous materials, anything like we're saying up here, 30 minutes within where that build site is. To tell you the truth, guys, that's what's prevented me from joining the rest of these guys with buying up a bunch of land out here. You know, I'm a reclamation gravel pit developer in the greater world earthship community. I reclaim scarred land. That's what I do. That's what inspired me to do what I do. And to come to Crestone... I would want to talk to anybody and everybody who's built something and has got some feedback for me, and I'm listening to that advice. So I'm not upside down on this build cost. And another thing, collaborating with other builders, there's always a surplus of excess materials. Starting some sort of a restore thing, probably already have it here, where we can start to make things a little more affordable to truly develop a community like this. This community's been here a long time, and so has ours. And we're maybe 60% of the way done, and that's going to slow down. So there's a lot of things to think about and talk about if you want to talk construction. 
Oh, you don't have to do that. <laughs> um, wow, that was great. I just sat back and he said everything. <laughs> um, well, I think I think Ron was uh, definitely hitting the nail on the head. That I, for me, the first place I look whenever I'm designing for a particular place is I look to the indigenous culture. I look to what they've been using locally. Um, vernacular architecture for me is uh, is the starting place for me, and then I start looking obviously to nature. Um, how is nature moving? What are the resources that nature has to offer in order to bring into my home, to power my home? Um, and obviously, Crestone, there's a lot of sun. Um, I'm really interested in digging into the earth and using just the natural thermal mass that it has to provide um, it, to create stability in my home, because that's what I want. I want a stable environment. I don't want it to be fluctuating um, in, with the heat and the cold. So I look to nature, look to vernacular architecture. My ideal house would be a hybridization of all these different techniques that we're all talking about. Um, I don't believe there's one way of building for all environments. I don't believe that air creates the solution for the world. I don't believe that, you know, um, yeah, I don't, I don't believe there's just one way of building. I feel like there's combinations of techniques that we've all been developing that, uh, and techniques that have been here for ages, hundreds of years, thousands of years that people have been using. Um, I recently went to Utah and I met a man who blasted out his house in the side of a mountain. And it was the most stable, beautiful architecture I've ever seen. It blew my mind. All he needed was some dynamite and some diesel fuel. That's it. Motor oil and the fuse. That was yeah. Great. Motor oil and some fuse and a fuse. That's incredible. what he said. It was an absolutely stunning house. And um, yeah, that blew my mind. And it just made me realize we don't need to use all these resources, all these materials that, that, the, that the system is offering us, I think, that are toxic to the environment, toxic to us, the people that live in the houses. When we've got this, we're, we're part of the earth. We come from the earth. Uh, that's the least toxic material that we own. And I feel like that's what we should be resourcing. But I think a hybrid house, depending on the location that you're at, exactly what Ron said, the location, the altitude, and look to nature. It tells you everything you need to know. Um, so that's it. Uh, you said community. And um, this community has um, thankfully embraced me. Um, I've been coming here. Um, there was a long stretch, but I actually came here in 2004 for an all-night meditation from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And in the morning, I drove into town to see what the town looked like, and I was like, oh, that's not much. Uh, but there was a sign that said free puppy. So I got my puppy that morning on New Year's Eve day. And um, I've been coming here for the last couple of years uh, with the hempcrete. And I've been here about 30 times plus in the last year and a half, two years. And just to um, call it out, we, didn't, we needed a couple workers. And I just trusted in this place, the space, and uh, community came together. I saw uh, Jaku. I just met him. He's this fantastic worker that's um, helping us out. And a, a big thank you to Suzanne Rouge. Um, not only did she supply our uh, beast of a machine, um, we don't have a name for it, but I kind of like Roxanne. Um, Sir Mix a lot. Uh, there it is. So Suzanne um, not only uh, helped the mixer help us uh, with the mixer, but she's been on site and she's just a badass. And what I hear about this place is, um, if you're not on the vibration of this place, it will spit you out whether you like it or not. So you, you can build a home here, you can build your $2.5 million box, and um, uh, Nick has told me that people have built here and then just left in three months because they can't handle it. Uh, the, the vibration here, you have to match it. Uh, so community, that's what it's all about. Yep. Great way to end the main Q&A section with community because now we're going to be turning to the community. I actually had a little bird pass me a fan question, or sorry, fan question, Jesus. So egotistical. Get this guy with the mustache off the stage. 
Um, this is a audience question. So we have about a half hour left, and sometimes, sometimes audience questions. This, this can this can be a while, depending, you know, if everybody has something that they want to ask. Maybe something even more complicated spurs another discussion. But we're going to kick it off right here. So in a moment. Um, I think we'll we'll do with what we can with the one mic on stage, the corded mic here, and then uh, if anybody has a question, we can pass around that that wireless mic into the audience here. But the first question that I had, um, Ron, <laughs> uh, please ask about the toxic off-gassing from tires and earthships. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, we've been hearing that for 50 years. Um, you know, the off-gassing from tires is definitely a legitimate question. We don't ignore that uh, as uh, air quality uh, testing system that we have incorporated for years because, you know, many uh, people have tried to shut down airships uh, specific to off-gassing. Our argument about that is... If you go into any tire store and you're picking out a pair, of, you know, set of tires, when you first walk in and you smell that that off gassing, you've been more exposed just in that little bit of time putting your tires on your truck than you will living in this house. I've been in these homes nearly two decades. Kirsten's almost three decades. We seem pretty normal to you guys. I know I seem a little <laughs> intense. You know, maybe there is a little of the off gassing that's affected me on that. I don't know. Yeah, man, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, hey, man, compared to like a little bit of concern about what you guys are asking me to the toxic homes that conventional houses are putting out, we've done air quality tests. They, we just, we smoke that. There's no, when you pound tires and you fill it with earth and then you plaster a couple inches of adobe mud over the front and then you add your skylights and you add your ventilation tubes and that's a passive system. But if you do an active system, as long as air is moving through any home that you live in, it's not stagnant. It doesn't matter what chemicals you clean with or mop your floor, or do your laundry or eat. All that crap is way worse than any concern about off-gassing from tires. There is, again, there's been plenty of studies done with off-gassing, but when you entomb a tire, we've already done tests that if we set a tire out here in Crestown with the sun beating on it, it would take 2,000 years to fully break it down. And the elements that the planet provides, which is the sun, the wind, and the water, those are the things that break down petroleum products. That's where off-gassing, you're starting to develop, and you smell that. When you entomb them, you plaster them, and you take those three elements that the planet destroys all man-made product. I don't care how good you think you are, I mean, stainless steel, any of that. And oxygen. It's all, yeah, and oxygen. When there's all no that stuff, oxygen present, that's when there's right. no oxygen present, when there's no sunlight present, when the moisture level is, it's, and also the tires that we use have already gone on exactly. the road. All these tires have 40, 60, and if you're in Mexico, 150,000 miles on those tires. <laughs> you know, I mean, we were building in Jamaica, and this guy was driving a tractor, and all the, all the radials were popping out of the tires. I was like, man, I think you're due for tires. And we can pound those tires for you if you like. But, you know, I mean, don't, don't be so concerned about the off-gassing <laughs> when you've got so many more things on your job. You know, the environment itself, breathing the exhaust from your car, the guy that's parked at the light next to you with his diesel polluter. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say that you should not be concerned about the air quality in your home, but I'm here to tell you that that's not enough of a concern. And I want to say one other thing, which is that let's think about these walls as thermal mass walls. <laughs> so the thermal mass allows you to stabilize the temperature and to store temperature both to heat and cool the building via the design with its passive solar or natural ventilation. 
You don't have to build with tire walls if you want a thermal mass building. There's other ways. There's rammed earth. Mm -hmm. There's adobe blocks. There's compressed earthen bricks. There's lots of other ways to achieve thermal mass. So don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Look at the entire system. Look at the aesthetic that you want. Look at your climate. Look at what's going to work for you. And don't ship the tires if they're not already there. You know, we've shipped, we shipped tires to Easter Island. That was definitely a bummer. Luckily, they made a beautiful building. It's a beautiful music school, but uh, that's not my first choice. Earth bags are another way to build without the tires. So thermal mass walls, passive solar, those are the important things. Yeah, without the tires. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about tires. I'm, it's going to take more time. <laughs> um, does anybody else have a question? Well, let's get let's get that going out there. Hi, uh, I just want to say thank you all for speaking and sharing your hearts and your new perspectives. Um, my question is for the air Crete between air Crete, hemp Crete, and pumice Crete. Um, what are the benefits between all of those, and like where would you use each of them when building a sustainable home? Thank you. Oh wait, should we? Pass it to the next person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where would we build with these different materials? And what are the advantages? Okay, so um, we are trying to um, trap carbon. Uh, I would say uh, hempcrete is fantastic for doing that. It literally is putting a carbon filter on your walls. Um, Hempcrete, obviously, like we were talking about, uh, builds uh, locally. Where, where is pumice? Where, where do you get your concrete? Um, and how much do you need? So I, I would say with hempcrete, obviously, we get it 30 miles away. Uh, we tried really hard to find local suppliers. And so when we first got together, it was in the beginning of uh, COVID. And so that was a little tough, but we uh, are... Goal was to identify local supply chains because uh, our first bags that we got were from Canada and then we got some from France and we we're shipping binder from France. And so right now we're using a binder, um, uh, a lime from Austin, Texas, which is a little far for me, but um, then we get um, just a couple more materials at your local Home Depot and mix those together. So I would say just Wherever, wherever it grows, wherever it lives, uh, that's where you'd want to get it. Yep. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, so concrete is pretty much native to the world at this point. Um, you can find it anywhere. It's one of the reasons why we at Dome Guy are using concrete still. But there's also all alternative materials like magnesium oxide. I don't know if you guys know about magnesium oxide. Please look it up. It's an amazing material. Um, we've been experimenting more with hemp and uh, magnesium oxide, and we're finding our bricks to be like five times stronger now. Um, we're still not using magnesium oxide because it's not as, it's not as um, readily available, but there are mines around here. Um, so the, the cool thing about magnesium oxide is that you, have, you don't have to heat it to such high temperatures and um, you don't have to heat it for as long as you do concrete, um, to make concrete. Um, so please look up magnesium oxide and hemp. That's a great building material um, as an alternative. Okay, so do we have someone else ready with the microphone? Hi. Um I was wondering, with your different respective building materials, as these structures age, what kind of repairs and maintenance and maybe like pitfalls do they do they fall into these different types of structures? Okay, can I start with just something about that? So an interesting thing that happens with hempcrete is that it increases in its strength over time. Um, and we, we don't have too much time left for the uh, audience questions. So if it's okay, can I explain? Because I understand some of these things. So maintenance over time is always going to be like cracks and plastering on the walls for certain things, um, you know, in terms of your plasters. So that's just kind of always going to be the case with any material, whether you're covering tires with plaster, hempcrete with the plaster. Uh, certain materials will keep the plaster um, without it cracking longer. I would imagine hempcrete is pretty good because it already has quite a texture to it, as well as the aircrete. 
um, finishes that we do. But Aircrete and Hemcrete both have the property of, of basically being stronger as they age, which is an incredible property that those materials have that others uh, don't. So in terms of the maintenance over time, just the material alone, you're going to have a lot more maintenance in your home with moving parts and mechanical things, you know, like your toilet bowl plunger and your fridge and your stove and your lines. And, you know, there's going to be so many more things uh, rather than these materials. We're talking about the strongest part of your home here. Everyone here who builds is building with the beefiest, longest lasting, most blown out of the water type of material rather than going with a stick frame where your literally house is collapsing on you after 30 years because and your roof your roof of course everyone were the roof none of these are addressing the roof um i want to say something about uh, maintenance because uh it's i don't think people really realize so typical houses right now con uh, contemporary building stick framing we're using about 17 layers of, of uh, 17 layers of building materials that are due, there are, are potentials for failure. So a lot of these houses that we're building generally have, go from three to maybe five layers. So that is a really important key thing to uh, take into account. You know, like an adobe house, for instance, has probably like maybe two or three layers. So that's something to take in consideration. Yes, you do have to plaster sometimes and to maintain it, but if you have nice long big eaves, you're gonna get less exposure, you're gonna get less damage. Yeah, it's a good question. When it comes to maintenance, that pretty much freaks most people out when they're looking to buy into an off-grid house, an existing home. For this panel, it's easy because we're, we're contractors. We, you know, we build them from ground up, dirt to doorknob. So we understand how everything kind of comes together, the Lego set. Uh, the biggest thing when it comes to building anything, I don't care if it's a conventional cracker box or a fully off-grid uh, self-sufficient home, you have to understand how materials work together. And then you also have to understand that certain applications at a certain time is extremely important. Like right now, we're dealing with a lot of roof leaks. So I like to call out to my guys, hey, I call it a 40, 70, 72. What that is, is you don't want your temperature below 40, really much above 70 degrees, and you need about 72 hours of that stable controlled environment and that's really hard to do when you're working on tropical islands or during monsoon season so you've got to be you know really aware of the timing of certain product and if you do that and as a heavy equipment operator I can make a mistake very easily by over excavating and then if my guys come in and they pound tires on disturbed earth I can promise you there will be cracks in that tire wall and that plastering so if you're not mindful during the process of assembly, then the next homeowner is going to be having a fair amount of problems. It's pretty much could be avoided. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, share this? Oh, do you want to talk about systems maintenance too? Right. Yes, you want to engage with your systems. If you just expect to walk into a room and flip the light switch on without having considered you know, how much power you have in your battery bank, how long it's been sunny, what other things you've been using, then you might be disappointed intermittently. Um, we haven't run out of power at our house, but we're used to living that way and being aware of how to use the power, how to use the water, how to treat the uh, systems correctly, how to clean the filters on the water organizing module, how to clean our really disgusting gray water filter, which is a very basic system coming from our kitchen sink, has a woman's pantyhose stocking strapped to the end of a PVC tube to catch any, and I'm very religious about letting, not letting food particles go down the drain, but still, you, what you end up with is a turgid, slimy, stinky stocking that needs to be replaced every few months, and that's Ron's job to do that, so thank you, honey, for doing that, but... Um, that's what I'm here for. And you want to maintain the plants in the gray water cell because they're not just ornamental plants. They're an integral part of your wastewater treatment system. And so some people think, oh, you can just you know, toss a bunch of plants in there, let them go crazy. Well, it gets overgrown. The plants aren't healthy. You need to trim them and treat them with natural materials to keep the bugs off them and get them really thriving and happy because they'll keep your gray water clean. So I think... Um, 
you have to want to engage with your home. And it's not any more maintenance than a conventional house. It's just a different type of maintenance. And it's fantastic because you feel empowered and self-sufficient um, and knowing that the grid's never going to fail on you. You're making your own systems work. I just have a quick story to tell. Thank you. Um, very, very quick, yeah. Uh, so 1,500 years ago in France, when France was Gaul, um, they used hemp in a, uh, a little town in a bridge. Uh, that bridge is still standing today. It's the only structure still um, standing in a raging river. Uh, and a fun fact about that bridge is when the Nazis were fleeing, uh, they crossed the bridge and shelled the bridge um, with their tanks and it's still standing. So I don't want to say hempcrete is bomb proof, but it, it's pretty strong, pretty strong. Yeah. All right, well, I'm, they're, they're trying to kick us off. So if you'd like to ask your question, we'll see if we can answer it quickly. Okay, real quick, like, um, we're in the process of uh, building a earth bag home and we're a little bit behind schedule. So we came up with this idea um, as far as the main living area, which would have all of the plumbing and electrical type of stuff in it. Have you had anybody um, use a modular home and then outskirt the outer shell with the earth bag? And how does that work together? Well, I will tell you what, I'll make you a deal. These two fine individuals here are actually about to move over to the demo area where they're going to be doing a question and answer over there to continue for everyone who's still uh, jonesing and chomping at the bit to tear down this uh, utopian idea that we've just provided you with. So please uh, challenge us, question us, and uh, right now we're going to be unfortunately getting off the stage, but we're also all going to be available this entire weekend. All of these amazing individuals, give them a round of applause. They're really, they're really not just talking, they're walking the walk, and they have many years of experience, and we're going to be seeing them over in the demo area on the schedule that you can pick up at the Off-Grid Guru booth if you're interested, if you have, I mean, we are literally going to be going into the nitty and gritty of every single one of these building techniques today, so uh, if your interest lies more in one of these different specific materials and the demos, we're going to have a tire pounding demo, so we're going to be talking a little bit about earthships and Anything your heart desires, questions, uh, Ron's going to be doing the demo and Kirsten's going to be there to help out and ask questions. That's going to be right after we get off the stage here over in the demo area. And then later at... Where do you find the schedule? From? The schedule is at the Off-Grid Guru booth. You can find a paper copy of the demo schedule, which is different than the Creston Energy Fair main schedule. And then between 2 to 3.30 in the Wellness Village, we are going to be having an Earthships Explained talk there. So that's going to go a lot more in depth into the entire system of the home, specifically when it relates to Earthships. Recycling your water five times, growing your own food in your house year round, uh, passive thermal heating and cooling. So there's absolutely no systems, uh, no fossil fuels being used to heat and cool the home. And it's built with recycled and natural materials. So uh, after that, we're going to do the Earthship model kit demo there. We're going to sit out on the picnic tables, and I'm going to walk you through how to literally build a little model house uh, that you can take home with you. And uh, it's a family-friendly activity. You can get the tickets. They're $30 there. It includes the book and the model at the Off-Grid Guru booth. And thank you so much, guys, for coming out. This was such a fun time. I live for these types of conversations, and I look forward to all of your amazing projects moving ahead in the future and the ways in which we collaborate. So one more time, everybody, the builders. Oh, and I forgot to say, if you go to the Off-Grid Guru booth and you show that you've subscribed, we'll give you a free sticker.